All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Some Breaking Gun Reviews, and we're throwing in an extra 420 episode in today because why not? <laughs> and today we're going to be watching the 1996 movie from Dust Till Dawn. I'm really going after all the nostalgia feels here, so uh, I haven't seen this movie in a long time. And yeah, it's been a while. And, um, it's another one of those movies that takes me right back to when I saw it, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this was penned by Quentin Tarantino and directed by Robert Rodriguez, who uh, worked together on Sin City. They came up together, kind of, like uh, at, at Miramax, you know, a lot of Weinstein baggage there, but um, this was this is an excellent movie. This, this was one of those movies that took a lot of people, uh, didn't understand it. Um, when the movie starts, it's one way, it ends another way. It, it has a halfway through point, like, break into the movie where it starts out like Pulp Fiction and ends, uh, ends like, you know, The Lost Boys. Or, I don't know, not really like The Lost Boys, but... <laughs> you know, it goes from a Pulp Fiction movie to a vampire movie. And, you know, horror, gore, practical effects, everything. And uh, stars George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino, Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis, Salma Hayek, Cheech Marin in multiple roles, uh, Danny Trejo, uh, Fred Williamson, uh, Tom Savini. Wow, I'm pulling all the names out here. Doing pretty good. Uh, Lawrence Bender has a cameo at the beginning. I think the guy from the Metallica video is uh, the clerk at the hotel at the beginning. I'm making basically making the review right now. <laughs> so let's stop. Uh, let's 420 up. Let's wake and bake and watch from dusk till dawn. Damn. Oh, and that soundtrack for this movie. Holy fuck. All right. We'll see you guys in a minute. Like a dead man from a white oak tree. People sitting on porches thinking how things used to be. Dark night. It's a dark night. America's most dangerous criminals are headed for the border. Earlier today, during a daylight liquor store robbery in Big Springs, the Gecko Brothers killed another Texas Ranger. That changes the death toll to 16. One night is all that stands between them and freedom. Now, this is my kind of place. But it's going to be one hell of a night. Robert Rodriguez. From Quentin Tarantino. From dusk till dawn. Welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun Reviews. Back to do another 420 movie review. As in the intro, we're watching From Dust Till Dawn. Came out in, I believe, January 19th of 1996. 
we are still pretty fully baked right now after watching that movie. Um, I remember the date is because I was still 20 when this movie came out. Holy fuck. <laughs> but I remember the night that I saw this movie. Uh, I came back to my friend's house to tell them uh, about it. And they were all uh, basically on acid. <laughs> I remember that night so well. I came home and they were all like, one person was like sitting in their closet, you know, like, and I ended up becoming a babysitter that night. And it's one of the reasons why I remember the night I saw this movie. The other reason is because I saw this movie and it's been indelibly pushed out of my brain so hard that there are things about this movie that I didn't remember. Uh, I quote this movie all the time and don't re even remember why I say it anymore because I've used, I've, it's from this movie and I say it so say the thing so much and I hadn't seen the movie in a while that I completely it, it was just gone until I started watching this movie again. Uh, so, was this movie great? Yes. It was a great bait. Oh, yes. <laughs> I really sat there. I was all in. And again, like, uh, I took notes, but I'm going to try to s just use them as kind of an outline uh, for, so I can just kind of speak my mind. Because I got a lot to say about this movie as well. I mean, this movie came out, like I said, when I was 20. This is, that means that when Desperado came out, I was still 19. <laughs> Oh, maybe I was 20. Desperado and From Dust Till Dawn came out pretty close to each other. Uh, so close that I almost feel like production on Desperado didn't really officially close and they switched over to From Dust Till Dawn. Um, but that also could be because Robert Rodriguez, I mean, he is, I don't know if he still is, but like when he started and up through man like through like Sin City at least so he's probably still doing it the same way he's like a one man movie making machine this guy is so used to was so used to doing everything on his own I mean even in the credits uh, it says edited and uh, directed by he's one of those guys who does a lot he's got like he can make a movie like quick they're not always good especially the kids ones but I gotta give it up to Robert Rodriguez and being able to just he's like a real do-it-yourselfer like if he did he, if he wasn't making movies wherever he was making movies he'd figure it out you know what I mean it's like when uh when uh like when Radiohead left Warner Brothers or, or whoever they were making their music with uh or like REM you know like when somebody just gets big enough to and figures things out and knows the business enough long enough you can do it on your own I think Robert Rodriguez pretty much does things on his own for the most part. Uh, kind of the, you know, like, I think he kind of got that reputation of being like the cowboy outlaw. You know, him and Tarantino coming up together in the Harvey Weinstein days. So there's, this movie does pack some baggage. I, you know, I didn't think about it going in. Uh, would I be thinking about the Harvey, like, I did not think going in I was going to be suddenly thinking about Harvey Weinstein and the era that this movie came out and it didn't change my enjoyment of the movie but it made me question a few things that were going on probably in those days because there's just a I don't know looking back on it now and I don't mean to change gears because we're talking about this movie but it's also because I'm baked and I'm really open to a suggestion even from myself um, that a lot of the ways that the movies looked like back then in the dialogue and just there was just a, a, a sense that I got from the movie watching it this time that it really felt like I don't know it was a free-for-all over at Miramax like when it came to dudes it definitely seemed like a it seems like a real bro uh, kind of I don't know atmosphere this movie is like drenched in <laughs> like testosterone 
and I don't know it's just the way that they talk in this movie it just I love it but it's very un PC the dialogue in this movie I love Quentin Tarantino I, everybody knows I think the sun rises and sets on his scripts um, but like hearing some of the stuff now where I'm just like, holy shit, is this, like, no wonder 20-year-old me loved this movie. It's a good script, though. It's still a good script, but they were saying things that you just can't say in movies right now. Like, if you write the some of the stuff in here, like what's going on in this scene behind me, where they're talking about, uh, freaking, you know, a mongoloid, and, uh, they use the, they call up somebody a retard, uh, and, and it just... It, people say, you know, the pilots, you know, the people say faggot in this. You know, it's just, but, and, and they don't mean it like, there's no good, like, I'm not digging myself a hole there, but they don't, they're, they're saying it in the real, like, mmm, I don't know, there's, <laughs> we could get on how to talk about how to say words that, and, and not mean them the way they mean them on another video, but let's just say, like, Part of me was like wincing a little bit now when I wouldn't have then. Like all the lines sound like things that people say and how they say them. And it feels right for the characters that are saying them because they just feel like those kind of people. It just still kind of after all these years how language has changed even in modern movies. You just don't say certain things anymore. Whether that's for good or ill, probably more for good than ill, you know, it just means you gotta pick your words differently, but it's still kind of shocking watching this because, you know, a, a Tarantino script lives and dies by, you know, our movie lives and dies by the script. And I've noticed that he has, it seems, kind of backed off a little bit from some of that. Not much. But currently, I, I kind of feel like uh, his last two movies, and that I'm talking about the the Hateful Eight, because that movie's got a lot of hateful stuff in it. But it still kind of feels like a little tamer than his usual stuff, as far as like how people talk to each other. I'm not saying that he's toning it down; he's just picking his words more carefully. I think maybe I don't know. But in this movie, nobody's thinking about that at all. People just say whatever because that's... I was thinking about that watching this. this is, people talk like this. Like right from the get-go with the cop and the clerk, it's all really, really good dialogue. Um, this movie it was like my favorite vampire movie uh, after I saw it. But I, you know, but to be fair, I still hadn't seen a lot. I mean, I'd seen The Lost Boys. I'd seen Bram Stoker's Dracula. I hadn't been a big, big vampire fan. But I was a big Tarantino fan. That was the only, like, I had seen everything that he had done up until then. And I'd, I'd seen Desperado, and it, I was really proud of myself that I had seen El, and I owned El Mariachi. When I heard about El Mariachi, I went out of my way to go find it because it back then it wasn't just movies didn't just come out like and be cheap and easy to find not always uh, it wasn't until after uh, Robert Rodriguez got bigger that El Mariachi just became out there for everybody people didn't know what it was it was it was there was like I remember finding it at the store and just feeling so smug <laughs> To no one in particular. Nobody knows that you have this unless you tell them. I didn't, I had hardly knew anybody where I lived at the time in Wisconsin. So I'm buying this to be snooty to people that don't even know I own it or care. <laughs> but I knew I had it. That's the whole thing. And I think I still do that. I think I, I, I'm pretty sure I still do that on some level where I just go, well, I know I have it. El Mariachi, though, was a fantastic movie that pretty much showed, like, what Robert Rodriguez was capable of all by himself. 
him and Kevin Smith coming up basically at the same time too as Quentin Tarantino and all them. So like the seventies got Coppola, Spielberg, Lucas, and uh, Scorsese. Right, the big guys coming out of the seventies, and then the nineties had Kevin Smith, Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez. I'm trying to think of somebody else in there. And, I, and no, Michael Bay does not count. We're talking about people that were trying to make, like, like comparatively. Uh, I mean, I know Coppola was working at Paramount really quickly, um, you know, in the 70s. But, um, yeah, that's what we had. A little bit different. There's a different fucking style for sure coming out of the end of the 90s from the 70s. Holy shit. Um, this movie's soundtrack is killer. Whatever happened to soundtracks? I know they're out there. I know they exist, but there used to be a really big deal about soundtracks. Probably ending around the time, and well, you know, musicals always get their due. Like you know, when a movie musical comes out, I'm not including those. I'm talking about movies that have a soundtrack, not that that aren't based on singing already. In the '90s, soundtracks were fucking like really big. And like Pulp Fiction, I think, might have really kicked that off. Days to Confuse might have really kicked that off. Um, but maybe it was always like that. Maybe it was always like that. You know, I know people probably made a really big deal about South Pacific on LP back in the day. Uh, I say that because I just remember my grandparents having it and I just made a leap of... I don't know. <laughs> I just figured if they had it, then there was probably a big deal back then. I guess they're always a big deal, but man, those 90s soundtracks really kicked ass, including this one. And uh, I remember having all of them. Like, Tarantino and Rodriguez especially had really good soundtracks and, and a lot of their stuff. Miramax, a lot of stuff, like The Crow. The Crow series, they made bad movies after the first one, but their soundtracks were always really good. Um, so the soundtrack to this was fantastic. It's got Jimmy Vaughn, Stevie Ray Vaughan, ZZ Top, all these really great uh, kind of southwestern uh, rockabilly kind of sounds, blues, all that kind of good stuff. Um, George Clooney. <laughs> George Clooney, man. Uh, all right. He was still on ER. And this was him at his most, like, I heard things. There's a, a really great documentary, if you haven't seen it, called uh, Full Tilt Boogie about the making of From Dust Till Dawn. And boy, it sounds like it was a regular-ass fucking, I don't know, really. I'm trying to think of, like, what would you call that? I don't know, like a modern-day, I don't know. Everybody was a lot of sex going on. People were pairing up. Maybe that's what happens on every movie. I don't know. But um, that documentary is crazy. And, and this was him at his peak of his, before he started doing, like when he was doing pranks and stuff. And I guess him and other people would shoot Salma Hayek with a, a, a super soaker, you know. And, and that's what I mean when I was thinking about the Weinstein stuff. Like people were just allowed to just behave like that. Like it feels pretty off to just be chasing poor Salma Hayek who, look, She's put together in all the right ways, and I appreciate that. But she shouldn't have to run around being chased by guys hitting her with super soakers so that they can see her tits through her shirt. Like, that's the kind of behavior that was going on. And maybe it was all accepted and playful back then, but it just seems wrong now. Like, it just seems like that's not what you do. And I don't know. I don't want to be like... I'm not perfect. I've made, I make mistakes all the time. You know, I try to think about how I'm professional. Am I professional all the time at work? But this is a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> what they did, what they were doing on the set of this movie. Um, but Clooney is great here. Tarantino, as everybody knows that knows about this movie, is not good. But the thing is, is like the longer that this movie exists, the more creepy I think about his character. The more he really does fit. It's just that I wish he could just act a little bit better. He's gotten a little bit better over the years, but this is famously bad. This is like Sofia Coppola almost bad in Godfather 3, where it just, you can almost tell like he wants to look at the camera 
when he's delivering his lines or right after he's done delivering his lines and be like, was that okay? Kind of like, like almost like the creator can't help it. This is also a really risky movie for a director to be in because even though him and his buddy are bros and everything, uh, you're playing a psychopathic rapist and woman murderer who is a sex offender, which you don't even know where how far this goes. Like, he's a monster. And so, he's like the, the monster in m most of the movie. And it's just like, oh my god, you've got this, he's a really important character, and you've got this guy who, like, that's, that's risky. I mean, if I'm Tarantino, I'm thinking, man, aren't people gonna associate me with this character? Because people can say that they don't do those things, but if... I don't think consciously some people can even help it. So I feel like being in this movie and that taking that role is a pretty hardcore thing. Like what he does to her, um, which is interesting. That this movie is very graphically violent, but when it comes to this, it's what we don't see. I thought it was an interesting choice that they don't shy away from the violence when it comes to ripping people's throats out and all these bikers and people getting killed at the end of this movie. And the, like the sheriff at the beginning and the poor guy gets set on fire but when they get to her this is how they they show like how much of a monster Richie is he's got a quiet soft-spoken shy voice but underneath is like that monster it's ready to click like as soon as they cut to black that hard cut where he's watching TV and you think he's changing the channel but I think he's turning it off and so when he turns it off and they hard cut to this scene I think that's immediately, as he clicks, he moves on her. Like, that's how quick he does things. Like, it's just going to happen. And that's just like, holy shit, you know, like Tarantino, like, especially with things that came out of Weinstein and just things that came out about him in general a little bit, you know, with Uma Thurman and all that, it just, I don't know. You always find out bad stuff about these guys later on. <laughs> and you go, can I live with liking their product? I think I can, but it's just, like, re like I know we barely really touched, talked about this movie. We've been talking about, like, peripheral stuff and how times back then were different. But it, I can't help it. Because that's how the movie really affected me this time. Because I enjoyed it, but it's all kind of coming out now. Um... So, like, they don't show her get killed. You see it from Seth's... Seth's looking at it. Richie's behind him trying to explain it. And then they just do this really quick fight club, and you, you know, blink and you'll miss it, cigarette burn, doop, um, moments into the scene where you just see blood everywhere. And you know that he's just demolished the room. It's covered in blood. She's just ravaged and killed. I thought that the way he handled not showing that level of violence, showing that the real monster is Richie, the rest of it is like, I don't know, taken more for for laughs, like part of the journey. I mean, uh, might as well talk about it since we're talking about it, like with Richie as the monster. I think what's interesting is that when Richie dies at the end, like really dies, uh, you know, he gets bit, he turns, and at first Clooney's like, nobody mess with my brother, you know, he's still my brother. And then when he, somebody says like, hey man, it's not your brother anymore, you gotta understand that. And he looks at his brother, and he sees, you know, like when they put the makeup on him, he's like, Rah. right? He sees that at first, but then he looks through when the next shot hits, and it's Quentin Tarantino standing there with just fangs and some weird eyes and blood. It's him, to me, looking through the vampire and seeing the monster that he already was. And that it doesn't matter if he's his brother or not. Like, this, he's, it's got to go. It's got to end. And so that's like when he's like, I'll, you know, here's the peace and death that I never gave you in life. Although, I mean, these guys in this movie, they're bad people. Like, I was thinking about this this time. It's like when, when I uh, first was watching Breaking Bad and I was all on board with Heisenberg. Like, nobody gets in his way. I don't give a shit. All the way to the end, I felt that way. All the way through the end and after it was over. But then when I rewatched it, you know, you really... 
you really when you let yourself just sit there and watch it again after committing yourself to one way of thinking about it rewatching breaking bad and seeing how walter become like i accepted his badness for the sake of my enjoyment of the show but once i turned that part of me off and watched it again i see i see all the how people could see like oh god like certain people left the show after this or certain people left the show after that cuz they couldn't take watching this guy that they once sympathized for become this way. My dad's actually like that with Better Call Saul where he can't watch any more of it because he liked him before and now he doesn't like him anymore. And in this, like, I feel like... <laughs> Man, did I just like really go off uh, off book on that where I was talking about <laughs> the freaking... All right, so basically, you know, we're talking about how Seth is. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Harvey Keitel, let's just jump to Harvey Keitel. So Harvey Keitel, because, man, uh, you know, this is going to be how it is. Uh, Harvey Keitel, I loved in this as well, playing Jacob, the preacher who lost his faith and is now taking his kids in an RV all off to see the world, basically. Um, because this is so off type for him everybody you know he's always like either a, he's a heavy whether he's a heavy cop a heavy criminal you know or like Winston Wolf who you know can get shit done for bad people like he's just so good at that kind of role playing a pastor is so crazy and his journey which I'll admit, like, when I watch this movie, you know, I kind of go, well, all the shit that happens, like, the character stuff and everything and how it all ends, I, what does it really even matter to the character? I don't know, like, but he goes through a thing where by the end he finds his faith again, and, but it's like at the, at the end where he's already basically, you know, he's going to be dead in a second. But I really like him in this because he's able to go he's go to toe to toe with Clooney without you know using violence like Clooney's the swearing punching shooting one and Jacob can get his point across with just talking and here I am got this thing paused behind me I do love this that they've got the death toll up there like reading it like lottery numbers oh plus that's Cr Kelly Preston. Kelly Preston, John Travolta's wife, back in 1995, they were filming this. John Saxon, the great John Saxon from Enter the Dragon and Nightmare on Elm Street was in this as well. Um, Juliette Lewis in this movie has never looked more wholesome. She's really pretty in this movie. And when I say that, like, oh, she's always pretty. Look, I know I'm not Brad Pitt, but... Uh, Juliet Lewis, she's she's an eccentric kind of person it seems, and but in this movie, and she played a lot of eccentric characters. She plays a lot of goofballs, a lot of weird characters. This she just looks normal, and she's so pretty. She's so pretty. It's just this like I never like I'm actually attracted to this version of Juliet Lewis. She's also really really good in it, and I, know I do that all the time. I got to start with the whole. She's really, really good in it, and she's pretty. I always start with the pretty stuff. I don't know why I do that. I don't know if that's ingrained in my brain or what. But she's really good in this. She's really funny. And even though this movie, to me, the more I watch it, the less funny I find it. <laughs> and the more I've like been thinking about it. Because it's the, the Gecko brothers are awful people. He's a professional thief. His brother's a fucking psycho. They've tore ass across you know Texas and the Southwest robbing people killing people he gets arrested he gets busted out they kill more people they're trying to run to Mexico with the money that they have which by today's standards is probably nothing even by t they, those standards it didn't look like that much um, and you know they go and they kill a cop at this Benny's you know world of liquor and they kill the clerk and then later you know when confronted with his brother here 
You know, he's like, is this what, you know, what I, you know, what do you think I am? You know, he's like, I don't, I'm a professional thief. I don't kill people that I don't have to. But at the same time, I kind of feel like it's a hypocrite. Like, he's a hypocrite. Because, like, he says to the family, like, I'll kill all, like, you guys can all live forever or die right now. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to kill you. Does he really mean that? All right, does that if they say that they're not going to go with him, does that mean he has to kill them? Does he see it that way? Is that what his logic uh, part of his brain is? Like if Harvey Keitel literally tells him, "I'm not going with you," in the script, you know, like did do do people who write scripts consider that? Like, what if this character says no? What's the logical thing? Is this guy going to kill them? And I kind of feel like he would. And that's what makes, to me, I think that he's a hypocrite because, honestly, if he's that kind of guy, tie them up and take it and figure out another way to drive in there or try to find somebody else he can roll or force the old guy from the hotel to do it. I don't know. But, you know, the more I watch this, the more I see this. That's what I was trying to get at way back then was seeing the characters who think they're good guys become bad guys. So, like... <laughs> Finally got back there. So, you know, because I think Seth sees himself as kind of an honorable thief, and he's not. He's anything but honorable. Just because he keeps his word in certain occasions doesn't make him a good guy. He says cool things, man. He's got the cool black hair. He punches people right. He's that guy that, you know, the women want to change. <laughs> but... <laughs> he's not changing for anybody, you know. He's that's why Clooney's perfect for this part, really, because uh, Clooney just does Clooney, you know. I almost feel like he's married and had kids just so that people would fucking shut up. <laughs> You're like, fine. Like, tell the wife that there's a clause in here that I'm still gonna do everything I've ever done before. I just need somebody to like look good on my arm, have some kids, so that I can just still fuck off. I'm sure it's not like that, but. You know, um, so I, I think that Seth though really does see himself as a, a good person, an honorable thief when he's anything but. Like when they first even get to the bar, he starts shit outside the bar with the guy that you know Cheech Mirror outside, and yeah, he's a, saying terrible things, but like he just br he doesn't like to be touched. So his response is to break the guy's arm, break the guy's hand. Then his brother kicks the shit out of him. So you start shit outside of the bar. You got to understand that it's going to follow you inside. So it's almost like he wants the whole plan to fail. Like he wants to sabotage because he, just because he's the most biggest, he thinks he's the biggest badass in the room. And by the end of the movie, he would be considered the biggest badass in the room because he's the one still standing. Does it mean that you're a good person? Or that you can be a good person, or that you know, like all people are just all evil or all good. He thinks he, I think he thinks he's more good than evil, and that's just not so. And I love that. I love watching this now, all those years later, and having that different opinion about it, having a differing. Like I still enjoy the fuck out of it, but I care less about whether he makes it or not. It helps that I know that he does, but. Uh, sorry, you got a little distraction here. Okay, I'm sorry. There's somebody talking really loud uh, in another room here in the house. So uh, we're going to try to power through that. So, yeah, we've talked a, a lot, but we're going to keep going. <laughs> um, I love when he tells Quentin Tarantino to put in your bit. Like they look at him as a little less scary now when he does that but it's to me it makes him more scary especially like when he talks to her later and you can see that whole shy business that he does where it's like did you mean what you said there back in the room what did, what did I say to you well, you know when you said you would eat out your and he's about to say it and she you know like it's just he mm. Man, he's so fucking, so creepy. Um, in my cool book is a good line. Um, there's always a dewdrop place, the motel. 
That's something that I always thought when I when I saw this movie. When I first saw this, is there's always a Drew do- drop something in in a town. Drew drop motel. Drew drop inn. Drew drop tavern. Drew drop whatever. Um. Let's see. Uh, and since I, he's, he's honorable, soft spoken. Wow, I'm really following these notes on accident. The one punch knockout in the in the RV. The Batman punch out. Where he just goes down like a sack of bricks. Those are always hilarious. Uh, like, and then uh, yeah, I said just because Seth's in a good mood now doesn't make him a piece. Doesn't make him not a piece of shit. Um, but who's gonna wake up? Like, right, right? He punches him in the face. He wakes up and he's just like, "Hey, man, what happened?" And he's just like, "I don't know." I mean, like, who doesn't remember their fucking cold cocking them in the like, just punching them in the face and knocking them out? Um. So let's just get to it. After all of that, man, I took just this was just before they got to the twitty, titty twist, twister. This is everything else after that. Holy shit! Um, so Cheech Marin's pussy speech during this thing it made me cringe then, and it still makes me cringe now. I don't know what it is. If it's just somebody just. He's just listing all the kinds of vagina that they have that you can purchase for your pleasure. And he's saying them all. And it's like, just because it's Cheech Marin doesn't mean that I can list. I, I, I was probably, I, I was cringing, but I was also thinking it was edgy back then. But now I look at it and I'm just like, oh my God, please make it stop. Um, but I'll tell you this. With the way America is, the titty twister has the best fucking marketing, the way to market themselves for what they are. You have a giant topless woman getting her boob pinched. You have a guy outside screaming that if you buy one vagina for a penny, you can get a second vagina for, like, no, a regular price. You can, it's okay, so it's basically a prostitute. You buy one prostitute at regular price, you get the second prostitute for just a penny. And you're in Mexico, where you're invite, where it's a, a, supposed to be for truckers and bikers. It's basically a gourmet for vampires. It's perfect. It's perfect marketing. You know, you don't have to be on the internet or anything. I mean, in '96, it really wasn't an internet, but it's pretty genius. And that was one of the things that got me thinking about this movie was, was this all a mistake? What happens at the titty twister? Because when I'm watching it, all those other times, really, right, the only question I had was, how is this place not noticed? How does nobody know that out in the middle of this area, because they're not deep that far off from the border, all right? Let's not forget that they're not that far off from the border. They can't be, right? Not in the time that they were driving. So... Right not too far from the border is this place with a Incan pyramid behind it that was, I guess, apparently some storm must have buried it over the years. Figure that out. So, they and nobody notices like truckers and bikers would be missing a wholesale. If this place is open every single day, right, and every single day people go in there and then they don't come out wouldn't that eventually track some people back? Plus, in the daytime, all right, if you're coming from the other direction, you're going to see a giant pit full of old semi-trucks and cars and everything just smashed into a hole next to a giant fucking Aztec pyramid or whatever kind of tribe it was. That's the one part, right? Like, figure that out. Or, then there's the other part of how many people have been missing from this area, from this place, if they were smart, right, they wouldn't be just taking everybody that came through there. they pick and choose, right? If they were smart vampires, they were not just bloodthirsty beasts. Like, they looks like they know how to run a business, right? They're not all, like, fiends like some of them seem to be. I mean, there's a whole bunch of bats flying around. They're probably the poor peasants that just try to get whatever they can get. Think about that. Keeping all those vampires in line from not just killing everyone. That's a lot of fucking vampires. So they have to have a good working business plan (laughs) so that people wouldn't find out about them. 
keeping all those vamps fed would be fucking tough though. So what I was thinking is, is what happened here a big misunderstanding that just escalated quickly? So because Seth breaks Cheech Marin's hand and nose and Richie socks him in the sides, what turned into a couple of guys getting thrown out, right? That's how I think the vamps thought they were going to play it. Was that it, even with Selma Hayek there, it was supposed to just be a quick, easy, get these guys out of there, and then we go back to business as usual. We take some people, the rest of them leave. You know, I don't know. I'm starting to think that that is probably what happened. And then Seth and everybody turns it into a fucking bullet festival. And now everybody's dead and it's just people, you know, people are turning vampires or people are everything. So the cover's blown. And so they just, they basically go, well, fuck it. We have to kill everybody here to keep our secret that has to be out of razor's edge. Because like I say, how does nobody know about this place already? And they were like, fuck, like, if, if they actually had won the day, if the vamps had won the day, they'd be like, how do we cover this up? <laughs> because there's a lot of people, all these trucks and everything, that we, you know, people do need their shit. If we take too many deliveries, if we kill too many people, they're going to fucking notice it. Maybe they should have filled in the fucking, you know, landfill in the back, but... All I'm saying is I don't think this was meant to happen. I don't think that this was just a nightly occurrence where they fucking just feed on everyone. Now, I've never seen the show. I've actually been thinking about seeing the show. I've seen, a, like, the second From Dust Till Dawn with Robert Patrick, and it was only because Robert Patrick was in it that I saw it. Um, surprisingly, wasn't the worst thing in the world, but I think it was because uh, one of the guys from Pulp Fiction who played uh, one of the guys in Zed's place, the guy with the mustache and shit, he was in it. Um, but otherwise, I don't really understand the lore too much. I imagine, I, I kind of glean some of it that this all like happened in the past. We're not here to talk about that either. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the lore is what I'm saying. And so I want to see more about it. I want to see if the TV show maybe has a better understanding because I know it's partially produced with Rodriguez's company, right? Um, so I don't know if it's canon or not, if it's just a new retelling, if they're going to explain things a little bit better in that. But I just think it's interesting that this whole place is, it was operational anyway. Um, and that this all could have been avoided if Seth hadn't started shit outside the bar. That they would have just left. They would have saw Salma Hayek come out and then do that wonderful dance of hers. And holy moly. Like, she's short. But man, did this movie make her look tall. With... Ugh. <laughs> Uh, well, before I get myself into too much trouble, um, Selma's done. Oh, well, her. Let's, we gotta talk about that dance though. It's a perfect siren song. See, before I was thinking about this being like not your usual night, right? This is the perfect way to just kill the whole audience that's in the not in the theater, <laughs> but in the bar. It's if she comes out there, right, and. She just gets everybody thinking about sex. Not that they weren't thinking about sex already, because you got a bunch of people dancing on your fucking tables, and you can buy prostitutes and stuff. But when the meet, when the candles go up, the lights go down, and Sama comes out with a snake walking across your tables. Um, I don't think anybody's thinking anything but Salma Hayek and what you would want to do to her. And so that's like the perfect time for them to just be like. Whoosh, kill everyone like they would just be like what and because <laughs> everybody's just imagining banging sound my eye anyway i just thought it was a really good siren song also very young danny trejo in this now i don't say how young cheech marin is in this of course he's younger than he is now but danny trejo since he's become popular in the last 20 ish so years you know was really you know, he got his bones with the Rodriguez movies all the way back in Desperado. And boy, boy, was he even younger looking. Somehow he got younger looking in this than when he was just in Desperado earlier. I don't know how that's possible. But I also thought that it's interesting that this is a room full of outlaws. Like, again, smart. You don't want anybody walking into your bar. People that people will notice. Um, wow, I wrote all this down and I covered all of it. Uh, 
Juliet um, Juliet Lewis, I thought was interesting that she's the first one who saw any of the vampires change. Um, and like I said, I quote this movie all the time. I didn't even remember where it was from because there's like so many little things that they say that I'm not even going to go into detail how many there are, but there are little moments in this movie where just somebody will say something. And I, I just realized, I was like, holy shit, I say that all the time. And I never remembered that it was from this movie. Uh, but there, this was the kind of the problem, one of the problems with this movie is it had such a massive tonal shift, kind of like how my review is all over the place. You don't know really where I'm going. <laughs> I never know where I'm going. Um, no, I do, but not right now. Um, is the, how it starts. Like, yeah, it has the explosive beginning, but then we go right into the diner scene, and then just a lot of talking and people having conversations, and just in the RV or whatever. There's no reason to think that we're suddenly going to become a vampire horror movie, and I think that that bothered some people. I don't know people that that just kind of like From Dust Till Dawn. It's either for you or your or or not. There is, I don't really know anybody that's ever been in the middle of the road about this movie. Um, let's see. Buffy and Blade got smart with dusting vamps. <laughs> yeah. Because at first I was like, man, I forgot that the bodies burn up later. But So I was thinking, man, there's a lot of dead bodies in the, in the room. Also, speaking of dead bodies, I think it's interesting that the band played by Tito and Tarantula, a real band that I used to be obsessed with trying to find in the in the late 90s, because back then, again, before eBay, before Amazon, if you couldn't find it at your store, you couldn't find it, and I was obsessed with finding their music, because it's really good, but when they turn into vampires, suddenly their guitars are made out of body parts, I thought that that was, there's some very cartoonish shit in here, like the, the big giant rat thing, like sex machines, head pops off, so that means he becomes a giant rat monster. Okay. Um, T Trejo burned. Okay, yeah. Salma has Jessica Rabbit's lips. There's that scene where she's talking above Clooney when she's got her hand, like her foot on his chest. And I was like, holy shit, Salma Hayek has Jessica Rabbit's lips. I just now noticed that. I know that's not anything important, but. I just noticed it. Uh, also, I what the thing I don't know uh, that people don't really really think about in this movie is that she wasn't just the the main act that comes out and dances. She was like the queen or something like that, right? Like she was their leader. She wasn't just she was literally the person to come out last to be like, look at me in all my glory as we're about to eat some of you. Um, at a four Tony moment, which this whole video is. Deciding who lives and who dies in movies. I was always thinking like, because all these people, right? Only characters that live, people that we knew. And it's like that in every movie. And I just always wondered like, what would it be like if an entire movie was just filled with the ones? Like if everybody in the movie was a bunch of Neos and everybody was supposed to be the one, then who lives and who dies? I don't know. That is a real 420 moment. Uh, I like the four different looking vampires that walk up in that like standoff where a couple look kind of human one just looks like a fucking monster um and we're basically going to have to stop <laughs> the movie because at that point it turns into nakedness and uh boobs and everything everywhere so that's as most I didn't think I was going to be talking this much I honestly didn't guys um but after this movie, like I said, I really want to know the backstory more. Um, yeah, I love the line, now let's kill that fucking band, even though I like Tito and Tarantula. <laughs> and somehow they blow themselves up. They blow themselves up. That's not the first time. Like the, the Fred Williamson vampire, uh, he has that Vietnam flashback when right before Sex Machine kills him, played by Tom Savini. Well, Fred Williamson's character has like a Vietnam flashback where he's talking about gutting all the Viet Cong that were that killed his buddies and then he's talking about the flesh covering his bayonet. He gets turned at that moment. Well, 
he gets a gun, like a shotgun, shoved inside him, and when it pulls out, it's full of like green guts because apparently, when you turn into a vampire, you don't bleed uh, regular anymore. And uh, <laughs> he sees the, the the guts, and he kills himself out of fear. Okay, I mean, you basically just go, all right, fuck it. it again, it's the Avengers Endgame. Either it's all a joke or none of it is. Um, Uh, da, 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 da. How did nobody see? How did nobody see Sex Machine come up behind him? They're all in a, a big giant room. What do you do? Like slide on? No, everybody would be on top. Like everybody's head would be on a swivel. You just saw a whole room of full of people get killed. You just had to help kill some vampires. Somebody sneaking around Fred Williamson looking like that. I'm sorry. Um. Clooney's delivery of I want to send as many of these devils back to hell as I can is way off. He's like, I don't care about living or dying anymore. I just want to send as many of these devils back to hell as I can. <laughs> Look, it just kind of walks and just trails off. Speaking of which, we got to play this clip. Now, again, there was supposed to be a trailer before this. I hope there is. And again, I hope this clip shows. If it's not, if the clips aren't here, I apologize. Uh, it doesn't really tra change too much of the movie. But I really wanted to throw this clip in here, which is probably the best written, like, lines of the movie. It's, it's a nice moment between Clooney and Keitel. I know why you lost your faith. How could holiness exist if your wife can be taken away from you and children? I've always said that God can kiss my ass, but I just changed my lifetime tune about 30 minutes ago. Because I know that whatever is out there trying to get in is pure evil straight from hell. And if there is a hell, and those sons of bitches are from it, then there has got to be a heaven, Jacob. There's got to be. So which are you? Are you a faithless preacher? Or are you a mean motherfucking servant of God? I'm a mean... servant of God. And in case that didn't play, that's just Clooney telling him, like, you know, uh, basically, I know why you lost your faith, but I need a, are you a, a faithless preacher? Or are you a mean motherfucking servant of God? <laughs> um, which was like, it's like why, why, why did it sound like he, was his character supposed to sound like he was trailing off? Like he just, he'd seen so much, he's just like, I don't even care anymore, I just want, to, I just want them all to die. Uh, poor Ernest Liu. Now, if you don't know who Ernest Liu is, um, probably because nobody does, uh, Ernest Liu was in this movie, and I don't know if he was in anything ever again. He plays the son uh, of Harvey Keitel. He's not, he wasn't a good actor, and I, I, try, I didn't want to talk about him that much because it's like he, 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 he was just a kid. He was just a kid, but he was not a very good actor. Um, better than I would be, probably. Who knows? Uh, Clooney's Jackhammer. While it's great on paper, it looks cool, is so impractical. It's so impractical. You can't move. Even him, he's like, what the fuck did I choose this for? But all the other weapons in the montage they did of making the holy water balloons and the crosses on the arrow tips and the bullets, so they would make sense when you shot somebody that was a vampire or going to be a vampire, that they'd blow up. So, and speaking of blowing up, I mean, the practical effects in this movie were so fucking awesome. I, they were so awesome. All the vampires looked really original and unique. You know, everything in this was just really, really well done as far as practical effects. I mean, yeah, you had to turn off your suspension to disbelief, but like Harvey Keitel's head when it gets all like melted off, like half of it because of the holy water bomb, and then his head exploding, and then the, a whole bunch of them all exploding. They really did a good job on all of that stuff. Also, pay attention to the extras in the scene near the end when they're all supposed to be uh, fighting at the end when George Clooney goes, kill them all! And if you watch like the, the extras in the background, you can tell that they're just being told, you just stand there and go like this. You, go, you just stand there and go, rah, rah. It's hilarious. Um, is this the only truly supernatural movie 
that Clooney's ever done, and I don't mean Attack of the Killer Tomatoes or Revenge of the Killer Tomatoes or whatever the Killer Tomatoes movie it was that he was in. Um, I mean, since he became the Cloonster, he's never been the Cloonster. <laughs> but since he became George Clooney actor, you know, as soon as he got on Roseanne or ER or whatever, uh, I don't know if he's ever really. I mean, I don't count Solaris. I don't count Batman and Robin, and I'm trying to think, and I just, it can't hit me, and somebody will tell me one. Somebody will tell me one. I'm sure there is. There's got to be. Um, Fred self-terminates, yep. Uh, the shoot more holes. Okay, so they get to the end. There's only her and Juliet Lewis left because she has to shoot her brother, and he blows up. <laughs> And uh, sorry about your brother. Uh, and so it's just them. And he says, shoot more holes in the walls because it's almost time for the sun to come up. It's the sun's up, but you can't tell because the place is all sealed up because there's vamps inside. Well, apparently, you know, they start shooting holes in the wall. And the only thing I could think of is shoot more holes in the plot. But um, bum Sorry. Um... So yeah, they the the Carlos played by Cheech Marin for the third time uh, in the movie, oh you know shoots his way in the disco ball. Sunlight hits the disco ball, which is pretty cool. Hits all the vampires and they all explode. And apparently, when they explode, when you run from the place, you need to have a great big ball of fire shoot out for no reason whatsoever. Uh, sorry, they're not human combustibles. They're just flesh and guts. They should have just been covered in guts. But that, that explosion, there's no excuse for that fucking explosion. I'm sorry. It doesn't even look that great. <laughs> but then we get the line, though. The great line that Clooney says to Cheech Marin after. He goes, what were they, psychos? And he goes, no, did they look like psychos? No, psychos don't explode when sunlight hits them. I don't care how fucking crazy they are. <laughs> And so it's almost like they needed the explosion just so that Clooney could say that great line. Because it is a great line. I'm sorry. And it's like, again, uh, I was listening to somebody talk about script and screenwriting and everything, and it's Clooney's delivery that kills it. So, uh, And then he just leaves her there. I'm a bastard, but I'm not a fucking bastard. You're, you're leaving her outside of a vampire nest in the middle of nowhere. And you, you think make, not taking her to where you're going is worse. I mean, I guess if, I, if they... And here's the thing. Why didn't they think about franchising this? I mean, they made the DVDs, right? They made the directed VHS or whatever movies. And Juliette Lewis, let's face it, probably could have used the work. Because she's worked. Steadily. God, I'm making it sound like she's an awful actress or something. I really like her. Um, this could have been a franchise for her. Make her fucking Buffy before Buffy, because Buffy came out in like 96, not the movie, the show. Um, you know, they could have had Juliette Lewis be a vampire hunter. I mean, to me, that's the logical step for her character left there with some money, and you'd want revenge on all the vampires that killed your family. Did George Clooney leave her in a better spot? No, he is a bastard and a fucking bastard. And he's not the hero that he thinks he is. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. But it's such a fantastic, fun, glorious ride. The, the script is pretty great. If you can handle some real rough dialogue, uh, the gore is great. The horror is great. The practical effects are great. The acting is great. Everybody is having such a blast in this, even if it is in the questionable Harvey Weinstein heyday of 96. <sighs> Who knew that this video was going to turn out like that? So, anyway, I had a great time watching this. I had a great time talking about it. I had a great time waking and baking watching it. Hopefully this was entertaining for you to listen to or watch you know, so if you did like this please hit the like button comment share subscribe at the bell for all notifications Whew, we'll be back with more stuff later have a great day peace out don't forget about uh, I don't know if this is gonna be up before the live stream tonight but uh, if it isn't if it is we'll see you guys there otherwise I hope you liked it bye